We are less than one week away from the premiere of the new Vampire Academy series on Peacock. And I wanna talk about it. The teaser, the trailer, pictures and a bunch of interviews with the main cast and the showrunners are out and I need to work through my thoughts. I'm making this video because no one in my real life wants to listen to me ramble about this, so I'm turning to you. Vampire Academy was my favorite book series when I was a teenager. And getting a second chance to see it on screen is absolutely amazing. I am aware that there are going to be lots of changes and I don't know how I feel about that yet. I've seen comments from fans on YouTube and Twitter and so on, some more critical than others and some very excited. I am doing this for me to figure out what I want out of an adaptation of Vampire Academy and how that fits with the show. As a fan, I would prefer a more faithful adaptation but I also understand that changes need to be made. The goal here is to manage my expectations, because I know that we are unlikely to get the third adaptation. Sadly, this is not a freaking Jane Austen novel, where you get to have thousands of versions out there and you can pick the ones you like and discard the ones you don't. And since I hated the movie, I need to give this reboot a fair shake, because otherwise I'm just left with two adaptations of my favorite book series that I don't like. This is not what I want. Corinne Martin summarized my thought process in one sentence in her article called The book is better. What makes a good adaptation? Expectations must change, because if our expectations are too high, we will never be able to enjoy the beauty of a book on screen. So that is my reasoning as to why I want to be optimistic about this new series. I do not want to be someone who is impossible to please and who doesn't allow for any deviation from the books, especially since they are not perfect in my opinion. On the other hand, I do want to formulate what is important to me and what I can reasonably expect from an adaptation. If you are a fan like me, who wants to sort through their thoughts and feelings about this, this video is for you. Also spoilers, obviously. Let's start with the people involved. First off, Julie Black. In May 2021, we learned that Julie Black and Margaret McIntyre would be adapting Vampire Academy for Peacock. I will only talk about Julie here because I don't know anything about Margaret other than that she and Julie have collaborated in the past. Julie is best known for being the creator of the Vampire Diaries. Now in case you lived under a rock for most of the 2010s, the Vampire Diaries was a huge hit for the CW and ran for 8 seasons. To me, it is oddly surreal that we now have Truly Black as the showrunner for VA. Most of us are probably aware that having her develop the series into a show didn't exactly come out of nowhere, but is also not something that was sure to happen. There are tweets over the years, going back to as early as 2009, about her liking the books, how she was excited for the movie, and later on stating that she would like to adapt the series. Based on those public statements, we knew that Vampire Academy was on her radar, but she was fully occupied with the Vampire Diaries and other shows such as the TVD spin-offs, the originals and legacies. Margaret McIntyre was an actress on TVD and has writing credits for both of the spin-offs. Considering how busy Julie Black was, her adapting Vampire Academy seemed more like a pipe dream. Personally, when the Vampire Diaries came out, I was super excited, but only went on to watch, I don't know, maybe five full episodes before I gave up. I wasn't invested in the characters, the relationships they had with each other or the world in general. Therefore, I was always skeptical of Julie and didn't want her to touch VA. That said, TVD was very successful. The success of TVD is the reason why, in the early 2010s, some fans actually wanted her in charge of the adaptation while nowadays she has fallen out of favor. From what I can see, that comes down to two things. First, since the show has ended, there has been a lot of conversation around how the show portrayed black people, in particular Bonnie Bennett, who was played by Cat Graham. Aside from that, we learned that Cat apparently also wasn't treated all that well behind the scenes. I don't want to get into that here, but it has probably influenced the decision to up the ratio of people of color, both in front and behind the camera of VA. Secondly, people didn't seem to like where the Vampire Diaries was going, especially in its last few seasons. And fans of the book series were disappointed by how heavily it deviated from its source material. 
which strikes me as relevant when talking about her ability to be a showrunner for Vampire Academy. This, the trailer and what was said in the interviews about all the changes, has led many people to believe that she is either unwilling or unable to make a faithful adaptation. I want to counter that a little bit by saying the following. Contrary to The Vampire Diaries, we know that Julie Black is a huge fan of Vampire Academy and has read all six books and I think even Bloodlines. I don't think she ever really tried to stick to the books beyond the first one where TVD was concerned. I also don't think that the important canon chips like Rose Dimitri and Lisa Christian are in any danger from what I've heard in the interviews, as opposed to some stuff that happened in TVD. My fear is less that she will deviate from the books too much, but that she just isn't that good at writing. As I said, I didn't like The Vampire Diaries, which had a lot to do with the way the show was written. From what I've seen, especially the last four seasons, were... Uh, trash? So that is what really worries me, together with some of the stuff that she has said in the interviews. For example, it seems that the script was done in quite a rush. Julie said in an interview that Peacock said yes to the project in April and to start filming in September. That doesn't leave a lot of time for pre-production. J. August Richards mentioned in another interview that when he signed on, the script wasn't finished. While that makes a lot of sense considering the limited time she was given, it doesn't inspire much confidence when it comes to the writing. On the other hand, they had only 10 episodes to write and not 20 or more like it used to be normal for a TV show. And again, Truly has liked these novels for years and even though she didn't actively write for the show, ideas have probably been bouncing around in her head for a longer time. So it might not be a big deal. Additionally, not producing the show for broadcast television gave her some other freedoms, such as varying lengths of the episodes, swearing and stuff like that. She indicated, and that makes sense to me, that those are aspects that influence the quality of a show. Another thing that I didn't like was something that was said on the Comic Con panel. There she mentioned that the decision to not kill Mason off quickly, within the first five episodes or something like that, was made because they really liked the actor, Drew Liner. It does seem like this was Marguerite's idea, but Julie went along with it, so I'm including her in my little rant. When I heard that, I was reminded of how that also was something that she did more than once during TVD. And from what I heard, that didn't influence the quality in a positive way. I am not a professional writer, or an unprofessional one for that matter, but this doesn't seem like a good idea. Please tell me that this is not how we are making writing decisions. Please. The performance and the charisma of an actor should have no bearing on how their storyline unfolds. I can see how it might be tempting when you feel that an actor really elevates the material you've given them. But whether or not someone is killed, especially Mason, is way too big a deal to be playing around with. It sucks to let go of someone that is really good. I get that. I don't even have any thoughts on how long Mason should have been on the show, but I feel very sure that this decision making process is deeply flawed. Then again, it seems like the script wasn't fixed at that point anyway. Therefore, this could be totally fine and maybe even better than killing him off in the first episodes might have been. I have no idea. At this point, I don't quite know whether Julie Black being the initiator of this project is a net positive or a net negative. For all I know, we wouldn't get this series without her, but there also seem to be some concerns. I will say, because I really shed on her writing and storytelling abilities in the last few minutes, that she seems to have a writer's room that she has given a lot of responsibility to. In this first season, she is only once credited for the writing of an episode if Wikipedia is to be believed. That gives me some hope. Now I know that including her here is somewhat misleading, as I said, let's talk about the people involved, but I still want to touch real quick on her non-involvement. I've seen comments on how her being left out of the making of this show makes people skeptical. Me, not so much. Michelle has always stated, even when the movie was being made, that film isn't her medium and that she wouldn't want to interfere. I think that is fine. In fact, I respect people who know and own their limitations. 
I didn't even understand why someone would assume in the first place that she should be consulted. Maybe that stems from the fact that she was a bit involved in the movie? She herself said that she had an advisory role and gave feedback on the script, costumes and the Psyhounds. She also did a cameo. I don't think that constitutes any substantial involvement. It certainly hasn't kept the movie from being an absolute train wreck. Apart from that, Richelle has tweeted in support of the show and overall, I don't think that her level of involvement is a deciding factor in the quality of the show. We are slowly getting into the actual content of the show. As stated in my intro, part of this discussion is to identify elements that are important to me and see how those square with what we already know about this show. That way I can be more conscious about what I'm probably not going to get and I can go into watching the show with my eyes open. This whole video was originally supposed to be a thorough exploration along the lines of what makes a good adaptation but the resources I had access to were sparse and I'm not an expert in this field so I'll have to make do with my own thoughts and two articles that resonated with me. Starting off with the question what makes a good adaptation already gives away that this is from the perspective of a fan of the source material. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's simply something that we should be aware of. Because showrunners have to consider more things. They have to make a show that is first and foremost good in and of itself. Then they have to consider whether they need to make changes to the material in order to make it more appealing to non-book fans. Then there's the whole process of translating the story from one medium to another and all the challenges that come with that. And then they have to figure out how to do all that while still staying faithful to the novels to make the fans happy. If you take off the first two, that'll give you high chances for success. Now you could also tick off the last two and that would work for a while because quality isn't everything. At the end of the day, what really counts is how many people watch it. However, if you make a poor quality show, that will only take you so far and viewers will eventually start declining. And that's bad. So what you really want to do is get the first two because they are deciding whether the show will get more seasons. After all, this is a business. What we can glean from that is that faithfulness, while maybe helpful in having at least a certain amount of viewers automatically, isn't the most important aspect. I don't mean to sound like a school teacher lecturing you like you've never considered all that. It's more meant as a reminder for when we talk later on about the changes. I think that there is an idea that the people who do these adaptations owe us because we are the built-in audience that might have enabled this production. This doesn't ring true here. The way Julie tells it, they gave her pretty much free reign and she decided on VA because it was a passion project. In addition to that, I also want to respect everyone in the filmmaking or I guess the serious making process. That means accepting that the people involved are artists and with that comes the desire to make the material one's own in some way. That didn't even occur to me until I read an article called What defines a good or bad adaptation? In it, the author Amber Troska notes that there is a soullessness that can occur when creators are unable to bring their own vision to the material. Attempting to reproduce someone else's work has got to drain some of the magic out of the whole process, leaving a vacuum. And that strikes me as true. Even I, as a fan, would probably make changes if I were to adapt Vampire Academy, because I have my own unique experience of the series. And those changes would probably be disliked by at least some part of the fandom. And I'm not insinuating that saying that they are artists means that every change is justified or that we have to like it. That means for us that keeping the changes to a minimum in order to maximize the fidelity to the source material isn't necessarily a priority here. But how do we still get a satisfying adaptation while making changes? Circling back to an article I quoted earlier, Corinne Martin writes that the key to making a satisfying adaptation for fans lies in identifying one thing, and that is, you guessed it. Say it with me, Cece. Essence! Yes. Well, I think yes. for us all. Everyone take a shot. Now, when I first read that, I was like, really? That's so freaking vague. I still think that, but I also think that she is right. 
By essence, she means the answer to the questions, what made you love this book? What made this book unique and captured the hearts of its fans? If I was confronted with that question and I had to boil it down, for me it would be I love Rose, her personality, her struggle between duty and love, her relationship with Dimitri and the fighting. Those are the most important points to me. If I include a little more, then I like the structure of the world, the Moroi ruling and the Dampiers being their guardians. Not because I approve of it, but because I think it's a good source of tension within the world. However, what the essence is to you, what you loved, might be something totally different. Maybe you really identified with Lissa and her mental health struggles. Maybe you really liked Adrian or the fact that there was Romanian mythology and, in general, Eastern European representation. Maybe you really connected to the high school experience or Mia's character arc and want to see that expanded upon. Obviously, we are all referring to the same source material, so there will be overlaps, but at the end of the day, it's still an individual question. As showrunner, you should try to identify the essence, which might not be terribly easy. I do think, however, that there are a few variables which are very likely to be part of what the fans loved, so staying true to them might be a good idea. These are the aspects that I've come up with and I have ranked them loosely here. Protagonists' personalities and their arcs, plus relationship dynamics. Main themes, general mood, genre, structure and rules of the world, plot points, protagonists' appearances, and the setting. And no, that doesn't encapsulate everything I liked about Vampire Academy. There's a bunch of scenes, secondary characters and so on that I really liked and would love to see. But if I really think about it, I could do without them. The list was made while keeping in mind that changes must be made. It doesn't mean that you should just discard everything else that isn't on there. It's a question of priorities and identifying what drew people in in the first place. Chances are it's somewhere in those aspects. So the more you can take off, the better your chances of making an adaptation that resonates with fans. There is also the fact that you can't always separate all these points. Certain character arcs may only be possible to do if you hit major plot points. Your ranking might look different. Not only that, it might also differ from property to property depending on what you liked about them and what drew you in. Or maybe what you really loved isn't in those points. That's where it becomes personal again. But I think these are probably all things showrunners should stick to as closely as possible. Definitely let me hear your thoughts on this in the comment section. Are there other aspects you would include or things that you would take off the list? Let me know. Before we dive into the actual content of the show, let's get one thing out of the way real quick. Obviously, with the information that we have already, like the teaser and the trailer, we all have gotten a feeling for what the show is gonna be like. And some of us don't like the vibe. I'm not here to tell you that you need to wait and watch the show first and can't have any opinions prior to watching it. Because you know what? When the trailer for the movie came out and I thought it looked overly cheesy and cheap, there were people saying, well, there is no way you can judge it just from that. Guess what? I had the exact same problems with the movie that I'd had with the trailer. Some things like certain shots and scenes or even characters are like, no matter what the context is, I'm not going to like this. If the vibe you get is too different from what you hoped for, it's okay to be disappointed. It's okay to opt out. I'm not here to take that away from you because we all have our own vision and preferences. Let's address the huge race-shaped elephant in the room first. The races and therefore appearances in the series are largely not as described as in the books. This was and continues to be a point of conversation. I don't want to go too deep into that because I have nothing intelligent to say on the matter. I've known about this for a year and although I wasn't thrilled about it in the beginning, I have had enough time to make peace with it. As seen in my ranking, the appearances are not that important to me. Related to that, there is concern about how Julie Black apparently sacrificed the Eastern European diversity and Rose being Turkish, that was already there in the books, for a more US-American version of diversity. 
That is likely one of those decisions that was made in order to appeal to a wider audience. For people that haven't read the books, this is not a problem. Apart from that, for a US American production being done in English, it is probably easier to find actors embodying a more western diversity than it is to find actors that speak an East Slavic language or can take on a convincing accent. I believe that a lot of that is just based in practicality and not a conscious desire to just erase a certain form of representation. This is only something that bothers you if you've read the books beforehand. Again, being faithful to the book, while important, is not the priority. I feel bad for the actors here because it seems that a lot of people learned of this series because of the release of the trailers and naturally that is the first thing they latch onto. Mainly because we don't know that much about the show yet. I do think that marketing should have had a phase earlier on where they could have made an effort to really put the cast out there. Maybe at the beginning of the year when the Peacock trailer for what's coming in 2022 came out and we got like 0.1 second of Empire Academy. That way more people would have had more time to digest it and get over it or opt out. I realize that there are people who have known about this for as long as I have and still aren't cool with it. I just think that we are so close to the show's premiere and it's gotta be discouraging for the actors that a good chunk of fans are upset about this. This should be a time of joyful anticipation and not dread for the cast. I also want to validate that you can feel that the actors might not be a good fit, not because of their looks, but because you didn't like the way they portrayed the character in the scenes we saw in the trailer. Maybe you just didn't get the right vibe. It's fine. Also, I'm not gonna comment on the accents. They hardly register with me, so I don't care. But I can see how you might be thrown off by all of these if there's no explanation for that. If you want to share your thoughts about this, please do so in the comment section. There is no real point in going into the supporting characters in a detailed manner because we don't know enough, so here's a quick summary. This summary is for the most part based on the first article that came out with the announcement. One important character is definitely Mason, played by Andrew Liner, of whom we have heard much good both from his fellow actors and from the showrunners. In the show they seem to emphasize his competitiveness with Rose much more, in addition to that, the creators mentioned on the panel that he's gonna be a more serious contender for Rose's affections, because he's going to be long on the show. His best friend Eddie, whose actor is Blake Patrick Anderson, will also be on the show, and seems to have a genuinely platonic friendship with Rose, which, now that I think about it, I really look forward to. The only confusing thing is that he is actually a redhead when Mason isn't. We also have Meredith, who is a no-nonsense guardian played by Rian Blandell and Mia, the social climber. On the show, these two are romantically interested in each other. Meredith was a very minor character in the books. The thing I remember her for is that Rose took her out during the prison escape in the sixth novel. Certainly not something I would want to be remembered for. Mia and Meredith as a couple could be interesting since it is a Moroi Dampier pairing and I wonder how that is seen in this society. Probably not overly positive, especially since it is already stated that Mia sees her attraction to Meredith as a hindrance. As far as I know, Mia has taken on aspects of Natalie because Natalie won't be on the show. Mia is Victor's adopted daughter along with Sonia Karp, who is her sister in this. Therefore Mia's last name is not Rinaldi, but Karp. Sonia is a librarian, not a teacher like in the books, which I actually like better. Sonia's actress is Janetta Kaiser and I watched her interview where she said that she read the books when she was a teenager, which is great and endears her to me. Her romance with Mikhail, played by Max Parker, is gonna be more present in the series, which I personally welcome. Victor, who was very present in the trailers, is played by J. August Richards and he seems to be nothing like the Victor Dashkov in the books. He is described as a kind and trusted advisor. At least, that's how he's introduced, so we will see whether he turns out to be evil like in the books. I wouldn't really mind either way. The actor said in an interview that because Sonia and Mia are adopted, they don't have the kind of status that his biological children would have. That's great. Not because it's a good thing, but because it fits the Moroi's obsession with their bloodlines and it also explains why Mia feels the need to be a social climber even though her father is quite high up in the hierarchy. 
there are also a bunch of new characters that I'm leaving out of this conversation. You might have noticed, I don't have any deep thoughts on any of this because the storylines have changed so much that I can't even say whether those are necessarily good or bad ideas. I wasn't attached enough to any of these characters to be upset that they have been changed for the show, so in the spirit of this video, I'll be optimistic about that. In an interview, Julie and Margaret did tease that Adrian was gonna show up in the first season, and at the end of August, it was revealed that he's gonna be played by Leo Woodall and would enter the show in episode 6. He is described as charming, devastatingly good looking, and a fun loving bad boy. He has a penchant for collecting art, throwing rages, and drinking too much. A flaw less to do with his addiction than a battle to medicate an inner darkness he tries to hide. Which mostly sounds like Book Adrian. Overall, that checks out. A small thing that bothers me in the description is that I think medicating one's inner darkness is what could give rise to an addiction, not something that hasn't anything to do with it. I think that was weirdly worded. An aspect I'm afraid of is that with him being in the first season and Mason playing a bigger role, that their relationships with Rose overlap too much and we end up in a weird love square since Dimitri is also involved. That is something I don't need on my screen. I think the decision to have Adrian relatively early on was needed especially to keep the fans happy. I personally would have liked to see him introduced in a potential second season, but in order to get a second season, maybe they felt they needed Adrian. Next up, a closer look at the main characters. Christian Ozera is going to be played by Andre Day Kim. I hadn't heard of him before, I actually hadn't heard of any of the actors before. Andre seems to be best known for Degrassi, which I don't know anything about. But he is the one actor in the main cast that I liked from the get-go. The hair and the slight build just really fit my mental image of him. I can't say too much about Andre as Christian because he's hardly in the trailer and I have heard him speak maybe one sentence in character, so I guess that'll be a surprise. I have seen him in interviews though where he talked about his character. And I think that show Christian is pretty true to the books. The only thing that stuck out to me as different is that he is searching for faith-based answers according to the article and spends a lot of time in church according to Andre. Which is not something I'm crazy about, but once again we will see. I am interested to see in how well he'll play Christian's snarky and sarcastic side since he seems like a total sweetheart in the interviews. And I totally want to see him use his firepowers that were teased in the trailer. Lisa's actress is Daniela Nieves. Her looks differ the most from the book description. She has neither Lisa's blonde hair, nor her green eyes, nor her tall figure. As I've said, appearances aren't that relevant to me. I will admit I always really liked the stark contrast in Rose and Lisa's looks, as it was an expression of their personality differences. But I can deal with it. I have seen concerns about her eye color. In case you don't remember, in the books it is related to Jill, who turns out to be Lisa's half-sister. A revelation that ultimately enables Lissa to become queen. Jill has the same eye color as Lissa, so there's some foreshadowing there. At first I was like, yeah, that sucks. But then, by accident, I listened to book 6, Last Sacrifice again. And Jill having green eyes was never instrumental in figuring out that she is Lissa's sister. That was something Rose realized after she knew. In the books, I guess it served as a hint to the reader so that if you paid attention in book 3, when Jill was introduced, you were able to predict that it would be her. In that respect, that's not really essential. I will concede though that the green eyes are a Dragomir family thing and underline how important Royal Moroi's family lines are. It makes sense for each family to have prominent recurring features within this world, though I guess it wouldn't need to be the eye color. Apart from that, it seems like the whole plot on how or maybe even whether Lisa becomes queen is changed anyway, so it seems like a mostly mood point to me. Other than that, I would say that she definitely has a certain delicacy about her that I always envisioned Lisa to have. Interestingly, although Lucy Fry, who played Lisa in the 2014 movie, fit the physical description better, I never got that vulnerability from her. I also think that in the few snippets that we got in the trailer, what she said in her demeanor, 
actually portray Lissa pretty well. In the beginning of the books, she was pretty insecure and self-conscious about representing her family. She definitely felt the pressure and that seems to be the same on the show. Her mental health struggles will still be there, although Julie said that they reduced the depiction of self-harm. The only thing that was a little off was her line delivery in that one instance. I'm the royal princess that needs protecting. Rose gives and gives and I take and take. But that could also have been the editing. The rest is fine, so I'm not too worried. So Kieran Moore is or Dimitri and the changes made concerning him are probably the most controversial. First off, his looks. I'm actually pretty happy with them. Sure, he lacks the height and that's not ideal, but I don't care that much about it. It isn't essential in any way but to underline his godlike reputation. Kieran was a competitive boxer if his bio on IMDb is correct. That should certainly help to make him more believable as a guardian. His hair is not as described in the books, although he seems to have made an effort to grow it out. I vastly prefer him growing his hair out a little to slapping a wig on him and calling it a day. Book Dimitri's longer hair might not be a haircut that complements Kieran's face. Sadly, we can't all be Ben Barnes. And that's okay. I'd rather have this difference in looks instead of having him look creepy. So thanks for not giving all men the curtain treatment. Now the big thing. Dimitri isn't Russian. When I first heard it, I was kinda like, wait, but his name is still the same and super Russian. How are they gonna explain that? And then I thought about it and felt stupid. Because I realized that if I told you my name, you'd have no chance of ever figuring out my nationality based on that. It's not uncommon for people's names not to match their nationality. Especially in the VA universe. Granted, this is more of a moral thing because they are obsessed with their bloodlines and their heritage, but it makes sense for that to apply to some dumpiers as well. Now onto the more relevant question. Is Dimitri being Russian important to the story? Well, in terms of the vibe and the feelings I associate with BA, yeah, it kinda is. Because his Russian background does come in in two major ways, I would say. One, it's the source of his and Rose's back and forth. She calls him comrade and makes fun of Russia being cold. It is relevant because him being Russian acts as a foil to Rose with her US-centric worldview. When it really comes down to it, they of course can have banter without it stemming from Rose's very skewed perception of what Russia, or more specifically Siberia, is like. They just need to replace it with something else. What? I don't know. The second way Dimitri being Russian impacts the story is that Rose travels to Russia in the fourth book to look for Dimitri and kill him. With him not being Russian, this storyline is unlikely to happen this way. I guess there is a possibility that he has family there and that is where he would go. Then again, if you were really close to them, you probably would speak Russian. Dimitri would be the type of person to learn the language. But then, maybe he speaks Russian, but it's not his first language, so he doesn't have an accent. I don't think that's the case here. However, I would argue that the novel, being set in Russia, isn't the main point. The main point is that Rose, for the first time, is alone in the world without Lisa or the school routine. And that she has hard decisions to make. The geographical distance to the country where she is from does play a role, but it's not essential. I know that part of Rose's personal journey is becoming more open to other worldviews due to being in Russia, but again, there are other ways to challenge her preconceived notions. I feel like all this is not dependent on happening specifically in Russia, but I do think that him not being Russian makes things more difficult, because as I said, you need to replace all this stuff. I do hope that they keep him liking a certain kind of music. Doesn't even need to be 80s music. Same with his cowboy novels. I mean, he already has the duster. To me, it always showed that he is comfortable with who he is and what his tastes are. He doesn't feel the need to present as cool. I don't think this stuff is tied to him being Russian, so they could just keep that without any troubles. And including it would go, well, not a long way, but it would certainly help in giving us VA vibes. Aside from him not being Russian, they seem to keep the core of his character though. In my ranking, I put protagonists' personalities at the top, and I don't think that this is necessarily impacted by that. In the end, 
though it might hurt the representation side of it, being Russian is not a personality trait. He can still be stoic, dutiful, calm and sexy. Well, being sexy isn't a personality trait either, but it is at least in part rooted in one's personality. So yeah, all in all, I really like this Dimitri. The only thing that's throwing me off is this one line he said in the trailer. I would never bet against you, Rose Hathaway. I think portraying a stoic character without coming across like nothing is happening inside of you is probably a challenge, but I will watch the show before I judge. Rose is going to be played by Cece Stringer. She was recently in Mortal Kombat, in which she did a few stunts and she has a background in dance. I was a bit skeptical at first, but I like her now that I have seen the interviews and the trailer and since I know that she is a huge fan of the books. It seems like I am in the minority here though, because there are complaints about her saying they prefer Zoe Deutsch, who played Rose in the movie. Again, this might be because of the race change and the desire to see people come as close to their imagination as possible. Speaking of race, I want to talk about something that has come up specifically with Sissy here. She is black and clearly in a position of servitude within this society. We can see how this might look. It would be easy to just point the finger at Julia and say, clearly she hasn't learned anything. But in one of the Comic Con interviews she explained her position on that, essentially saying she heavily debated that and came ultimately to the conclusion that Sissy was the ideal choice and that they now had to create circumstances to make sure that this wasn't fishy. For example, by not having all Dampiers be of color and by not having all Moroi be white. There is a longer answer in the interview and you should watch that for yourself. Another change is that on the show, Rose is of age. A totally necessary and acceptable change. In this same age, you can't have her being 17 and hooking up with someone who is even just a couple of years older, even if he wasn't her teacher. I haven't quite understood if that means she is literally 18 or older. I'm guessing 18, since they are at St. Flats, so she can't be too much older or it would make sense to have her at school. I am wondering how aging her up has changed her character. Especially her ignorance of other cultures and her impulsivity. In the novels you could kind of understand, if not excuse it, because she was 17 and had never left the US and was going through a hard time. Then again, if she is 18, that probably won't make much of a difference. I've seen people dislike her line delivery in the trailer. Again, like Kieran and Daniela, I'm not gonna let that deter me from hoping. I definitely think that the lines are pretty on point for Rose and I'll see about the rest. I've also pondered this line of Rose. I want a life to call my own. Which I think is actually quite different from book Rose. In the books, I don't think Rose ever fights for a life outside of duty. She fights for Dimitri, I guess, is her way of claiming something of her own, but I still don't think it was ever verbalized like that. I could be wrong on that though. Anyway, I really look forward to that part and I really like Sissy in general. Okay, that was it for the characters and now on to the story itself. First, Rose and Dimitri. As I said, Rose and Dimitri's relationship was and is a big draw for me. From what we know, it seems like they kept their dynamic with the two characters being quite close to their book counterparts. However, it's going to be different due to the fact that she is of age as mentioned and that he isn't her teacher anymore but more of a mentor. In one of the interviews Sissy says that he is around to protect Lissa and that he is the perfect representation of a guardian. So in that way he appears to be some kind of role model. Following the show's focus on the class thing, the main hindrance in their love story is the fact that they are both dumb peers. We don't know their ages yet, so we'll see if there's a significant difference there or not and how that is handled. The actors certainly appear to be close in age, with Cece being 25 and Kieran seeming to be in that range as well. But who knows with these teen shows how old they are supposed to be. Julie did say that Rose and Dimitri's relationship was one of the two big things that she felt she had to get right. The other one is Rose and Lisa's friendship. That gives me hope that we will get some banter and close encounters between Rose and Dimitri in the spirit of the books, even if we don't get specific scenes. For example, we were already told that there wouldn't be a last charm scene, though Sissy was quick to add that there will be some kind of replacement. Based on the trailer and the promotional material, Sissy and Kieran seem to have great chemistry. I definitely like this iteration of Rose and Dimitri more than Zoe and Daniela, just in terms of how they look on screen together. 
the little sneak peek we got confirmed that to me. So I'm curious to see more of them. This is probably the biggest shift story-wise and if you can't get with that, you'll have a hard time liking the show. Instead of the high school drama of the first three novels, we get full-on Game of Thrones plus elements of the drama. And here's my hot take. That's a great decision. The main reasons for that are A. This is probably way more attractive to new viewers and therefore more likely to draw in a wider audience. And B. I was born too soon to enjoy watching mainly high school drama at this point in my life. While the court stuff was a bit boring to me when I first read the books, the fact that they now focus on it works for me. However, I do understand that this is a shift that is not a simple thing of, oh well, they have to change things because it's a different medium. This is a shift that comes down to a different creative vision from the showrunners. You could have done a show that would expand the world, but keep its focus on the school in the first seasons and follow the order of the books more closely. The power struggle at court is also tied to the closer inspection of class within this universe, because of who has the power to potentially take the throne. Julian Marguerite state very clearly that this is about a failing society that struggles because of the way it is structured. In the interviews, they keep saying that this is relevant because of what is happening now in the world around us. I don't know whether this is just a talking point and I shouldn't overinterpret what they are saying, but it keeps bugging me. The classism in Vampire Academy and its potential to be explored in an adaptation was always a thing. It has always been a relevant topic. In fact, that is one of the things that in hindsight I would have liked to have seen a deeper conversation and deconstruction about in the books. I know I shouldn't be so hard on them because they are clearly tackling that subject, but I hope that this is not based in mirroring the stuff that happens around us, but on an exploration of the Vampire Academy world and how that would play out there organically. Maybe that's exactly what they are doing. Maybe they are just doing this thing that you have to do in research papers, where at the very beginning you have to state why what you're presenting here is not totally pointless and a waste of time, and I am miffed about nothing. But I just wanted to say it. Because they pulled all that political stuff forward, they also decided to have St. Vladimir's and the court in the same place. That explains why they call their currency Mir's in an allusion to St. Vladimir. It seems that Vladimir will be a bit more important than the other saints. In the books, he was one of many. If you remember in the fourth book, when Rose goes to Russia, we learn that Dimitri went to a school that was, I think, called St. Basil's? So including St. Vlad's name indicates a greater importance to me. But maybe I'm just overthinking this. They don't only have their own currency, they also have their own language. Their language was teased in photos from the set and is also on the poster. While it is cool to have a language specifically for this world, it takes away from its Eastern European roots yet again which isn't ideal. It does raise the question how that language came into being when, for all we know, there were Slavic languages readily available in the times when this society emerged. Again, we'll see how this is addressed. With what I consider the main stuff behind us, I want to close with a few comments on minor points. In the promotional pictures and the trailer, we see a fair amount of fighting and training, and while I have seen people saying that they think the training looks a bit dated, that doesn't bother me. In fact, to me, the snippets look quite good. I am happy. Furthermore, I'm interested to see what the mood of the series is like. From the trailer, it's pretty serious and I like that. In the interviews, the showrunners have stated that they are old as well as modern places right next to each other. And I really want to see how well they manage to integrate these two and how that affects the overall vibe. I gotta be honest, CGI isn't something I care about too much as long as it isn't atrociously bad. So whatever the orange eyes thing is, probably compulsion will work just fine for me. The look of this tree guy seems to be okay as well. We haven't seen that much, but I hope that their superiority and strength, which the guardians have to counter with their technique, is well portrayed on screen. There is a lot of backstory that is not deeply explored and is told in flashbacks in the books. That is gonna get more space in the show. This is the reason that the show doesn't start in the same place as the books did and that we have gotten a way younger Tatiana than in the books. Because her political journey is just starting. At least that's how I understand it. We haven't been told too much about any of that. 
Also, because I'm very, very late to be uploading this, I want to comment on the character posters real quick. The posters are boring and I would do away with the character description since we will get to know them in the show anyway. It sounds all a bit stilted. This description is a bit weird with the whole carefree part, but I believe that refers to before her family died, so it's fine. I'm not sure I like the clothes or costumes. We will see how that looks in action. All in all, this is what I think. The show clearly falls short on the character appearances and potentially maybe some plot points. But we will have to see the show for that. Although just the shift from high school to Game of Thrones makes for a pretty big change already. Julie Black mentioned how they take fan favorite moments and put them on a mental whiteboard and then weave them into the story. We will see great moments and plot points from the books, just not in the same order and maybe not all of them. You can judge for yourself whether the main characters' personalities are close to how you perceive them in the books or not. For me, they seem close enough. I think people have taken the appearances that differ quite drastically from the books in certain places to be an omen or an indication for how other elements in the show will be adhered to, such as theme and tone, and I don't think that's entirely fair. They can still hit the right tone, examine the same or similar themes, and explore the underlying character dynamics as given in the books. In terms of my personal priorities with Rose and Dimitri's relationship, the fighting, Rose in general, the struggle between duty and love, and the structure of the VA world, I'm actually quite hopeful regarding my own enjoyment of the show. However, because of the shift towards court politics and the seeming lack of Eastern European visibility, it doesn't quite feel like Vampire Academy to me. The latter, in particular, makes the show feel somewhat generic. The last thing I want to comment on is the word adaptation. Calling it an adaptation when you change major things is really a disservice. It invokes an expectation of being faithful to the books to a high degree which often sets filmmakers, or in this case showrunners, up for failure. While there is always the possibility of adding qualifiers such as loose to the word adaptation, typically the word adaptation is what sticks with people and shapes their expectations. Now, you could ask, well, if you change so many things, why not just make your own show and not sell it as an adaptation? And that becomes a problem for creators of shows when they really like the source material but want to put their own spin on it. If Julie had done a show with two best friends with a special bond in a vampire world with three different vampires, set at least in part at the boarding school and one of the friends protects the other and has a love story with a mentor, at some point this becomes copyright infringement and we would have called it out. That wouldn't have been a great look for her. Julie herself says that if you are looking for a faithful adaptation of the books, you are not gonna get that. She did add that all the new things are done in the spirit of the book. Once again, what the spirit of the series is might be subjective. Alternatively, if they had just said, hey, Julie Black, you know, the Vampire Diaries creator? Yeah, she's gonna make some wild and wacky fanfiction based on Vampire Academy. The situation would have been entirely different. First, the fandom would have been collectively like, <laughs> Then most of us would have said, well, I'll at least check it out, even though I don't have high hopes. In this scenario, the only way would have been up, while we are currently looking at a situation where, for book fans at least, the only way seems down. On a smaller scale, the same applies to the secondary characters. I think it's a bit difficult for the writers to decide which character they are introducing as a new version. I mean, they could have just said, no, we'll have no Mia, no Natalie, no Sonia, but we'll have these two new characters, Trixie and Daisy or something. By doing that, they would have avoided the comparison initially, but then, because there would be inevitably recognizable similarities, people would be like, why did you change the name? They are clearly based on these characters in the book. So yeah, that's a tough spot to be in. Though, I'll be honest. Reading the name Mia Karp was a bit of a mindfuck at first. I was like, what? Mia and Miss Karp? Is this another version of the teacher-student romance thing? 
At the end of the day, some people are gonna be okay with the changes and some people are gonna be pissed. And that's fine. Personally, I predict that I will like the first season for what it is, but if the show gets more seasons, my affection will probably decline. That's just how it usually goes for me. The challenges come when there needs to be payoff for all the setups. Still, I remain hopeful. If you made it to the end, thanks a lot. Writing this was pretty therapeutic for me, and I hope you got something out of it too. If I made any mistakes, let me know. The next therapeutic thing I'm going to do is an autopsy of the movie. I just have so much to say and I need to get it out of my system once and for all. Until then.